In the fall of 1921, a chauffeur-driven McFarlane pulls up to the curb in front of Queen's Broadway Theater in downtown L.A. William Desmond Taylor buttoned his suit jacket and stepped out smiling at the throng of press people as he made his way into the theater. The brightly lit neon marquee read, William D. Taylor's production of Soul of Youth. Two months had passed since the discovery that his valet, Ed Sands, had betrayed his trust, stealing $4,500, crashing his car, and then disappearing. Taylor had felt violated, but diving back into work helped him regain his focus. And now he was the man of the moment. Soul of Youth had been a true passion project, and he was in high spirits attending this premiere. Inside the cavernous lobby, the director felt an arm reach around him in a congratulatory embrace. You've done a fine job, Bill. It was the voice of his young and talented production designer, George Hopkins. Taylor couldn't have gotten through the film without him or screenwriter Julia Ivers. They helped realize his vision. The movie was about an illegitimate baby who ends up in a cruel orphanage. The boy later runs away and lives on the streets with his dog until he finds a home with a foster family. It's a tale of sin and redemption and love, a story close to Taylor's heart. But the film was drawing critics, mostly from outside the industry. They called themselves moralists and claimed the film would corrupt America's young people with its depictions of so-called depravity and crime. Taylor didn't agree. He always believed in the power of art to tell stories about real people and real struggles. When faced with questions from reporters, he posed one of his own. How can we show a story of redemption without the temptations that came before? On the night of the premiere, every one of the thousand seats at Clunes was filled. And around the country, the film quickly became a smashing success, which meant his status with the studio rose higher than ever. Life was good. He was making more money than he ever dreamed of, creating the kinds of movies he wanted to make, and his circle of friends were intensely loyal. Hollywood had been very good to him. Even Mary Miles Minter seemed to be less of a problem. His request to move to another part of the studio lot definitely helped curb her relentless pursuit. As 1921 came to a close, William Taylor was feeling like a lucky man. Surely 1922 would be even better. We get support from Believe Her, a new true crime podcast from Lemonada and Spiegel and Grau. In September 2017, young mom Nikki Adamando shot and killed her partner, Chris Grover. She was sentenced to 19 years to life in prison for murder. Through rare access to police audio, a month-long trial, conversations with Nikki, and original reporting, journalist Justine Vanderloon lays out the killing, the evidence, and the aftermath. As the six-part series unfolds, listeners will put together different pieces of a disturbing puzzle. One thing is clear. Perception is not reality. Believe Her is a riveting chronicle that grapples with assumptions we make about domestic and sexual violence, the long reach of trauma, and the ways in which survival is criminalized, leaving us shocked at how far people will go to avoid seeing what's right in front of them. Believe Her premieres October 21st. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Wondery's shocking true crime podcast, Over My Dead Body, is back for a third season with a story about corruption, betrayal, and the secrets of a fallen hero. Follow Over My Dead Body, season three, Fox Lake, on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening right now. From Wondery, I'm Tracy Patton, along with my co-host, James Remar. This is Hollywood and Crime, Murder in Hollywood Land. On our last episode, a deep friendship blossomed between William Desmond Taylor and Mabel Norman, even as Norman's drug habits spun out of control. Lead investigator Ed King found the biggest clue to date that placed Mary Miles Minter at Taylor's bungalow on the night of the murder. And now he plans to do something about it. This is Episode 5, The Final Days. Thomas Woolwine is in a foul mood. He looks at the document in his hands one more time, almost willing the printed words to be wrong. The final votes have been tallied for who will be California's next governor, and it won't be him. After long days of stumping and speeches and kissing hundreds of babies, it's a humiliating defeat. His opponent, friend Richardson, took the election by more than 100,000 votes. He crumples the paper in a big ball and flings it at his trash bin. It misses. Now the fighting prosecutor has to bury his ambitions for the national stage and return to his old job. He hates the looks he's been getting all morning. Everyone from the elevator operator to his staff has been offering condolences, as if he were dead. The DA opens his desk drawer, pulls out a bottle of milk of magnesia, and takes a big gulp. His stomach is a mess. He blames it on the stress of the campaign. As if that's not bad enough, they still haven't found out who killed director William Desmond Taylor. It's becoming an albatross. Woolwine takes another swig of the chalky drink and notes the irony. Taylor suffered from stomach issues and drank the concoction daily. His secretary buzzes. Excuse me, sir, but Detective Ed King is here. The last thing the embattled DA wants to deal with is his hard-headed chief investigator. In the fervor of his campaign's last days, King had been busy exploring an angle that points to Charlotte Shelby and her daughter, Mary Miles Minter, in the Taylor murder case. This, despite Woolwine's clear instructions to lay off both the women. The detective practically bounds into the DA's office. I'm sure you've been preoccupied, sir, but I want to go over what we've discovered. At least King isn't mentioning the campaign loss. Woolwine interrupts him. I'm well aware of what you found. 
three blonde hairs, presumably belonging to Mary Miles Minter. Now King interjects. No presumption about it. The blonde hairs are hers. It's a real lead. The DA steals himself for a battle of wills. The hairs could have been there since her visit with Taylor a few weeks before. It was entirely possible that the valet overlooked them when he last brushed the suit. King strongly disagrees. The impeccable Taylor routinely had his clothing thoroughly cleaned. There's no way those hairs could have stayed on the jacket. The detective's stubbornness is perplexing to Woolwine. It's as if King has some kind of vendetta against the women. Detective, we've been over this. Witnesses describe two male figures near his bungalow, the shortest five foot nine. How do you reconcile that? Unless the women were walking on stilts. King isn't swayed. I've said it before. Maybe Shelby got a male acquaintance to pull it off, and it wouldn't be the first time witnesses have been wrong in their descriptions. But Woolwine knows circumstantial evidence when it stares him in the face. It all boils down to the simple fact that three blonde hairs on the victim's jacket aren't enough to impanel a grand jury. Read the papers. That poor girl has already been drawn and quartered in the press. I'm not going to be part of hurting her image more than it already is without real, honest-to-goodness, hard evidence. Go back and chase the leads that are still coming in. There's more than 3,000 according to the guys downtown. King's exasperation is written all over his face. Those are 99% cranks. We aren't doing anything but chasing our tails. But Woolwind isn't going to budge. They still haven't found the ex-valet Sands, and he seems the most likely suspect given his criminal past. Or maybe it's a simple case of robbery. He sits back in his tufted leather chair, exhausted. You're to cease and desist any and all attempts to interview Miss Minter or Mrs. Shelby. Look into the other leads and get back to the other cases that I'm sure you've put on the back burner. Taylor's not the only dead man in town. That is a direct order. But we're so close, King said. Woolwine cuts him off. It's done. On December 4th, 1921, William Desmond Taylor returned home from a long day at the studio. When he walked up to his apartment, he could sense something was off. The door was closed but unlocked. His new valet, Henry Peavy, would never have left it that way. He walked into his elegant living room to grab a smoke. But his stock of imported gold-tipped cigarettes weren't in their case. The hairs on the back of his neck stood up. He looked over his shoulder as he walked upstairs to his room. There were dirty shoe prints all over his bedspread, as if someone had purposely walked on his bed. He opened the jewelry box on his dresser. Some jewelry was missing, including a bracelet given to him by Mabel Normand. Who could have done this? He quickly phoned the police and reported the theft. Two weeks later, his valet, Henry Peavy, told Taylor he found the stubbed-out butt of one of his gold-tipped cigarettes on the ground outside the front door. Taylor never smoked in front of the bungalow. Clearly, whoever had stolen his expensive smokes returned to the scene of the crime. Peavy asked timidly, Do you think it was Sands? Maybe he's mad he's been replaced. Taylor suspected the same thing. Maybe his ex-valet returned to wreak more havoc. But what was his angle? Taylor's mood darkened. December would turn out to be a very bad month. Ed King arrives at Philippe's French Dip restaurant on Aliso Street and scans the room looking for his partner, Jesse Wynn. He finds him seated at the counter gnawing on a beef dip sandwich as big as his head. King walks over. Careful, son, or that sandwich is going to eat you. Before the sergeant can swallow his food, King continues. You read the paper? Wynn nods. King is referring to the headline in the Examiner dated June 6, 1923. Thomas Woolwine, the toughest nails prosecutor, has stomach cancer. The previous evening, he submitted his resignation to the county board of supervisors. It's a rough break, and King feels bad for the guy. But King has been spinning his wheels for months under Woolwine's direction on the Taylor investigation. The detective has been splitting his time between new cases and following up on Taylor leads when he can. But after a year and a half, the baffling murder is no closer to being solved than the first week after Taylor's death. Wynne finally speaks up. I feel sorry for the poor bastard, but Woolwine always had stardust in his eyes when it came to Minter and Shelby. Maybe things will shake open now. Any progress with Keyes? Asa Keyes is Woolwine's chief deputy. He'd been taking on more responsibilities as Woolwine's health declined. King corners Keyes to talk about the Taylor case whenever he sees him and he's pleased to learn Keyes doesn't have the same reservations about Shelby and Minter as Woolwine did. He tells Wynn, when Keyes is promoted as the new DA, the Taylor case will get back to the front of the line. No one wants an unsolved on the books. Wynn thinks this is funny. <laughs> Says you, because you can't let go. You sound like my wife. But he knows it's true. King can't let go. His wife told him he was obsessed with finding Taylor's murderer. He always believed his doggedness was part of his strength, but she didn't mean it as a compliment. But he's not about to leave a cold case for the next guy. One way or another, he's determined to get to the truth, no matter how long it takes. The new DA will still need convincing, but King is a patient man. William Desmond Taylor sat bolt upright in bed and looked at the clock on his nightstand. 3 a.m. Who on earth could be calling at this hour? Taylor pushed his feet into slippers and hurried downstairs, wiping the sleep from his eyes. He reached the phone nook and grabbed the receiver. Hello? Silence. Hello? Taylor listened. Nothing. Is anyone there? Hello? Then the sound of a broken line. He hit the lever and the operator came on, asking if she could help. He told her no thank you and quickly hung up. It was curious. When the phantom calls first started about a week ago, he hadn't thought much about them. A wrong number. But then they continued. When asked, 
Both Peavy and his chauffeur, Harry Fellows, admitted they also answered the phone only to hear no one on the other end. Taylor didn't like it at all. Back in bed, his mind raced through different scenarios. Peavy suggested his ex-valet, Ed Sands, might be behind the hang-ups. Taylor thought it was possible, especially since the bungalow had been burglarized and those cigarette butts were found outside the door. Sands smoked like a chimney. Or maybe he ruffled some feathers when he pressured the studio to deal with the drug peddlers on the set. The U.S. attorney even opened an investigation, and who knew what drug kingpins would do if their profits were threatened. Mabel's dealer made threats when he sent him away. Perhaps he was part of a larger operation, and they were trying to scare him. But that all happened a year ago. How long could they hold a grudge? God, he hoped it wasn't Mary. He took some deep breaths in and out. Whoever it was, he would deal with it. Right now, what he needed was sleep. In the fall of 1925, the Roaring Twenties are in full swing. Hemlines are up, and the mood of the country even higher. There's a recklessness in the air, and movie profits are building Hollywood into a fantasy capital where dreams are made, and everyone has a shot at getting a house with a pool. The William Desmond Taylor murder has all but disappeared from the papers. But Detective Ed King still remembers. It's been two years since District Attorney Asa Keyes took office after Woolwine passed away from stomach cancer. Keyes is finally allowing King to take a new look at the Taylor case. The detective has been crisscrossing the city on his motorcycle, interviewing and re-interviewing witnesses. They say solving cases is all about effort, time, and luck. King can't do anything about luck, but he can make sure he's putting in the effort and time. Four months later, he finds a small detail in the files that he may have overlooked. A quote from Charlotte Shelby, saying accountant Marjorie Berger personally informed her about Taylor's death before it was in the papers. Berger was Taylor's accountant. She was also the accountant for Mary Miles Minter and Mabel Normand. He finds her sitting in a cramped, cluttered office. When he tells her about Charlotte's statement, Berger shakes her head vigorously. My God, the next thing Charlotte will say is I murdered him. Absolutely not true. She told me about the murder. Berger insists Shelby called her at 7.30 a.m. the morning after Taylor's killing. King's heart skipped a couple of beats. He makes the accountant repeat herself. If true, it means Charlotte knew about the murder before Henry Peavy pushed open Taylor's front door. Finally, King thinks, I've got her. The future is unknown, plain, and simple. If you've been struggling with the so-called new normal, it's not just you. But stress and anxiety don't have to rule your life. If anything helps reduce stress and anxiety, it's talking it out. And our sponsor, Talkspace, has thousands of licensed therapists trained in over 40 specialties, including anxiety, depression, relationship issues, and more. If you have something specific you want to work on right now, they will find someone right for you. Talkspace is secure, private, and affordable. One month on Talkspace costs about the same amount as a single in-person therapy session. But with Talkspace, you can send unlimited messages to your therapist, and they'll engage with you at least five days a week. The bottom line is that we all need to talk sometimes. Therapy has helped me immensely, and Talkspace wants to give more of us the support we deserve at a price we can afford. As a listener of this podcast, you get $100 off your first month on Talkspace. To match with your perfect therapist, go to Talkspace.com or download the app. Make sure to use the code HOLLYWOOD to get $100 off your first month and show your support for the show. That's Talkspace.com, code HOLLYWOOD. In the small town of Fox Lake, Illinois, Joe Glinowitz was a hometown hero and a 30-year veteran of the local police department. On September 1st, 2015, just one month from retirement, he was found dead outside of an abandoned cement plant, shot in the chest twice at close range. While the town and Joe's family mourned his passing, hundreds of police officers launched a manhunt to find his killer. After weeks of searching, the lead investigator discovered chilling secrets about Joe, the local police department, and the village of Fox Lake. Secrets that, once uncovered, would put the town in the national spotlight and haunt them for years to come. Wondery's shocking true crime podcast, Over My Dead Body, is back for a third season with a story about corruption, betrayal, and the secrets of a fallen hero. Follow Over My Dead Body Season 3 Fox Lake on Apple Podcasts, or you can listen early and ad-free by subscribing to Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts or the Wondery app. In early March 1926, Ed King sits across from Charlotte Shelby. It's a moment he's been waiting on for over four years. But she didn't exactly show up willingly, or alone. She's here with her lawyers at the request of D.A. Asa Keys. Keys now has skin in the game. He even gives the paper a quote saying they're close to getting an indictment. So King is under pressure. He has to crack the imperious facade of Charlotte Shelby. But Charlotte is surprisingly all sweetness and light. Her attitude is downright pleasant, which makes King suspicious. She has a reputation as a battle axe, a tough cookie. Now she's beaming at the detective from behind her baby browns like the young starlet she once hoped to be. It's my pleasure to finally help. Please, ask me anything. This was so painful for both my daughter and myself. She even breaks into a sad smile. Jesus, King thinks. The only thing missing from this routine is an apron and a tray of cookies. He wonders what she has up her sleeve. He's not buying the den mother act at all. Ed King is now a lieutenant, and he doesn't hold back with the questions that have been nagging him all these years. He asks her about threatening Taylor on the set and telling the director she'd kill him if he didn't distance himself from her daughter Mary. Charlotte deflects. Mr. Taylor was the most perfectly poised man, 
such a proper man. She tells King she never noticed any sort of relationship with Mary. Whenever the two were out together, I was relieved. He was just a good influence, so patient and kind. King tells Charlotte he knows she went to Taylor's house with a gun. Charlotte laughs it off as if it's the most absurd notion she's ever heard. Why, I never quarreled with the man. We were friends. When King probes her about the 38 caliber gun her secretary said she owned, the same model of gun used to kill Taylor, Charlotte's response makes his heart sink. Oh, that old thing. It's gone. I believe my dear and departed mother threw it away. King presses her, but Shelby sticks by her story. When Shelby leaves the office, King quickly calls Asa Keys. He tells him the best actress in the family turns out to be the old lady. The DA isn't happy. The city is expecting an indictment. You convinced me there was something here. I can't get an indictment without some sort of proof. King knows Charlotte will never crack. The only thing he can do is take another run at Mary. The only problem is Mary is living in New York. King will have to call his counterparts with the NYPD and track her down for an interview. Mary Miles Minter, the teenage actress, is no longer a teenager or an actress. She's now 24, an adult, living on her own. Famous players Lasky let her contract finish out and never renewed it. She announced she is officially retired, but Mary is pretty much set for life. Her mother invested Mary's earnings well, and Mary gained control of her fortune when she turned 21. Now she spends her days as a star in her own passion play, hosting elaborate parties and dating eligible, yes, older, men. She hasn't fallen in love with any of them yet, telling anyone who listens that William Desmond Taylor is still the love of her life. When New York City detectives pay her a visit in the spring, she doesn't hold back gushing to them about her beloved Mr. Taylor. Then she says she'd be delighted to tell them anything they want to know about her relationship with the director. But they seem more interested in her mother and what she knew about Mary and Mr. Taylor. Mary's face screws up into a pretty pout. She tells them her interfering mother not only knew about her romance with Taylor, but she blocked it at every turn. One of the detectives cocks an eyebrow. You sure you and Taylor had a romantic relationship? Mary is indignant. Yes, they had a romance. It wasn't consummated, but the feelings were there. The detective bore down. Would her mother kill Taylor to keep him away from her? Mary looks away. She may have said, I'll kill him, I'll kill him. She was like that, always going to kill somebody. When the detectives call King and tell him about the interview, he thinks he has enough to make a case. He just needs to run it by keys. He's surprised when the new DA balks. Mary's dramatic pronouncements aren't enough to indict Charlotte. Juries were overly sympathetic to women charged with serious crimes, especially without concrete proof. It's not what King wants to hear. The tough old broad Shelby wins again. Two days before Christmas 1921, William Desmond Taylor was not in the holiday spirit. As he drove through downtown L.A., his mind kept going over the late-night phone calls. Between that and pressure at work to make the next great hit, he wasn't getting much sleep. But he had to admit it felt good to get out of the house and turn his mind to some last-minute shopping. After parking the car and walking through the crowds of Christmas revelers, he slipped into the white-columned hamburgers department store on Hill Street, where he picked out a gift for Julia Crawford Ivers, a blue polka dot silk scarf. His screenwriter and close confidant had been by his side for seven years, and he knew she would love it. As he turned to leave, he found himself standing face-to-face -face with Mary Miles Minter. They locked eyes for a moment. Seeing Mary was a shock, but he tried to hide the surprise and worry he felt. He directed the young actress in four pictures, and she mistook his kindness for romantic love. At first it seemed harmless, but then she started following him around like a puppy dog, writing syrupy letters and dropping them at his front door. She was a beautiful girl, but far too young for him. He wished her the best, but even if she was older, he wouldn't pursue her. She was sweet, but had no real intellectual curiosity. Of course, as a gentleman, he couldn't tell her that. In recent weeks, he'd been able to avoid her. He had hoped the distance had quelled her infatuation. But here, in the department store, he could see from the look in her eyes, it had not. He smiled and bowed politely without saying a word, and walked out of the store into the brisk afternoon. With any luck, Mary got the hint and he wouldn't see her again. Except in the movies. <laughs> Mabel Norman is lounging on a white sofa, watching the ceiling spin. She is happily drunk, and in no hurry to do anything anytime soon. She's been having the time of her life with good friend Edna Proviance and Edna's new love interest, a millionaire playboy named Cortland Dines. On New Year's Day, 1924, she spends the afternoon with a couple drinking, talking, and mashing croquet balls out on Dines' huge lawn. It almost feels like old times. After a few hours, they head into the salon to nap off the booze before round two. Mabel is lying on the sofa giggling when her chauffeur shows up. Doesn't she want to go home? He asks. He's being pushy. She knows he has an overprotective streak, but so far she's been too nice to fire him. But really, this is just too much. He's almost demanding she obey. Mabel tells him to take a hike. Before the kid has a chance to think it through, Dine starts to tease him, which the kid doesn't like. Pretty soon the teasing escalates into a full-on argument, and before Mabel can blink, the chauffeur has whipped out a revolver and is plugging Edna's boyfriend. Not one, not two, but three times. Oh my God, Mabel thinks. This isn't real. Dine survives the shooting, but Mabel is forced to testify at the trial and she's dragged into another scandal not of her making. The public hasn't forgotten her connection to the Taylor case. Now this new debacle causes several states to ban her films. The movie colony begins to distance themselves, and eventually, like so many stars who came before, the spunky, fun-loving Mabel Normand 
slowly fades from public view. In 1925, Mabel finds herself back in New York. She's done licking her wounds. She moves into a Greenwich Village apartment and attracts a new circle of friends. George Gershwin, Al Jolson, and writer Edna St. Vincent Millay. Literary people she and Billy used to talk about for hours on end. Sure, she still frequents the secret speakeasy circuit, but her money isn't just going to booze. She's a regular at the theater, art galleries, and bookshops. Billy would have been so proud. Away from Hollywood, Mabel grows into the woman Taylor always knew she could be. Where Max Sennett and Sam Goldwyn saw Clay to be molded to suit their needs, Taylor saw Mabel as a light burning bright, someone who just needed room to shine. It should have been a fabulous second act for Mabel. If only. In 1927, she starts feeling ill with frequent colds and infections. Mabel pushes through, thinking she just needs more rest. When she finally goes to the doctor, he diagnoses her with tuberculosis and tells her there is no cure. A year later, Mabel is often too weak to get out of bed. In August 1929, she checks into a hospital in Monrovia, California. Her condition only gets worse. She knows she is dying, but she still keeps her sense of humor, telling a close friend, buy me an ambulance. It's the only way to travel. You can lie down, smoke, and if you get into an accident, you're all undressed and ready for the morgue. She keeps stacks of books by her side. She still wants to do so much, but everything requires so much effort in her weakened state. On February 23, 1930, Mabel looks up at her dear friend and nurse, Julia Brew, and whispers her final words. I do hate to go without knowing what happened to poor Billy Taylor. And then she passes away. Late on the night of December 23rd, William Taylor was upstairs getting ready for bed after a long day. Just before midnight, his doorbell rang. When he opened the door, Mary Miles Minter was standing on his front step holding a tote bag. What in the world could she want? Taylor didn't want to be rude, but he most certainly did not want her here now. He smiled thinly. It is rather late, isn't it, Mary? She pushed inside and started yelling. If you just explained to me that it was over, but instead you left me in the dark. Tears were falling down her face. Taylor felt no pity for the girl. How many ways had he told her he wasn't interested? But she refused to hear him. Finally, he shrugged helplessly. I don't know what more I can say, Mary. Mary tried to embrace him, but he gently but firmly held her away. She shoved her hand toward him. Inside her palm, she held a letter. This is my farewell, she said. Taylor took the letter and quickly read it. The stationery had a monogram of a purple butterfly and smelled of lavender. Dear William Desmond Taylor, he read, this is goodbye. I want you to know that I will always love you. When he was through, he put it in the front pocket of his coat and said he understood. Let me walk you to your car, he said. But she didn't seem to want to move. He finally managed to escort her outside to her little roadster and held the door as she climbed behind the wheel, using her handkerchief to wipe the tears from her cheek. Then she grabbed his handkerchief out of his front pocket and replaced it with hers. Then she revved the engine and drove into the night. He went back inside feeling shaky. The whole incident made him deeply uncomfortable. While he was standing in the foyer, the phone rang. It almost made him jump out of his skin. He walked across the room to his liquor cabinet. He grabbed his special bottle of Irish whiskey, poured himself a double and knocked it back. Let it ring. He sat down in his favorite chair. The sound of the phone continued to reverberate around his apartment like a death knell. The Roaring Twenties are long gone. Prohibition is over, but the country feels like it's holding on to a permanent hangover. Everyone is running on empty. Movies are no longer silent, but not everyone can afford to see them thanks to the stock market crash. There are soup lines, bread lines, and desperate people willing to work for a dime. Everything has changed, except for a lucky few. On one sunny Sunday in April 1937, Charlotte Shelby lounges poolside at Casa Margarita. She spreads marmalade on a warm crescent roll, taking in the view across her property toward the Hollywood Hills. The morning air is crisp and clean. It's quite the life yet she often enjoys it alone. Shelby will turn 60 at the end of the year and is far removed from her days as a mover and shaker in the motion picture industry. Once called a bitch and a shrew for the way she managed Mary's career, she certainly got the last laugh. The whole country has been mired in a terrible depression and her managing skills have given her enough money for this rolling casita in the middle of tropical Los Angeles. And she did it alone, by her wits and her smarts. The butler appears and announces Clyde Murphy. Charlotte is surprised. Clyde Murphy is her lawyer and she was expecting a call from him, not a personal visit. And on a Sunday, no less. It's not a good sign. Her daughters haven't appreciated all she did for them. But she has made peace with that now. Sure, it hurt when her eldest daughter Margaret sued her, claiming Charlotte stole money that was hers. Charlotte blames liquor for Margaret's bitterness. She only had her best interest at heart when she put away Margaret's inheritance and sent her to a sanitarium to clean up. Margaret should thank her. But instead she is angry and is now suing Charlotte. Imagine suing your own mother. Which is the occasion for Clyde's visit today. His tone is serious. Margaret had a lot to say at the deposition. Charlotte sighs. How much does she want? Murphy doesn't mince words. It's more than money now. Margaret has all but accused you of killing William Desmond Taylor. Charlotte lets out a sarcastic cackle. Oh, God, Clyde, that was 15 years ago. Does anyone still care? Murphy isn't laughing. 
She's claiming that you and Mary weren't home the entire night of the murder. Is there any truth to this? For the first time in years, maybe ever, Charlotte is speechless. She has survived years of rumor and innuendo about Taylor's death. Will it ever be over? She squints up at Murphy through the infernal sunshine. How much? Yeah, that's the bad part. She's refusing to settle. If this goes to trial and the DA finds out, it could get really bad for you. Charlotte considers her options. She may not be a player in Hollywood anymore, but she hasn't lost her edge. What if we inform the DA ourselves? Murphy looks at her skeptically. Charlotte continues. We're going to turn the narrative around. Then Charlotte lays out a plan in precise detail. They're going to send the DA a letter, detailing Margaret's fabrications with the demand that this absurd accusation be investigated. In Charlotte's mind, it's a foolproof plan. We'll give them the last thing they expect. After all, why would someone who's guilty request a full investigation? We get support from Simply Safe. Living in a city, I knew for a long time I should get a home security system, but it always just seemed so complicated, which is exactly why Simply Safe was designed to be easy to use while protecting your whole home 24 7. You just order online with the click of a button, open the box, place the sensors, plug it in, and just like that, your home is protected around the clock. No technician or salesperson has to come and disrupt your house. You don't need to pay any outrageous monthly fees or sign a two-year contract. In fact, their 24-7 professional monitoring and emergency dispatch starts at only 50 cents a day. A Simply Safe system has protected my home for at least a year now, and there's a reason I'm never going back. It's easy to set up, easy to use, and I feel protected. It's really that simple. Head to simplysafe.com slash Hollywoodland, and you'll get free shipping and a 60-day money-back guarantee. That's simplysafe.com slash Hollywoodland to make sure they know that our show sent you. Once you've finished learning about William Desmond Taylor's grisly fate, it's time to check in on the Richland family and the fate of their father's legacy on Blood Ties Season 2. Last season was all about questions. What did Peter Richland do? How far will Richland Health go to bury the story? And when faced with the choice of telling the truth or losing billions, what side would Michael and Eleanor fall on? Stick around after the episode to hear a clip from Blood Ties. William Desmond Taylor was going through his Daily Mail when he saw the letter. It was two days after Christmas, 1921, there was something about the letter with its Stockton, California postmark that unnerved him. When he opened it, he found two pawn tickets for the jewelry that was stolen from his home three weeks ago. And there was a note. It read, So sorry to inconvenience you, even temporarily. Please observe the lesson of the forced sale of assets. A Merry Christmas and a happy and prosperous New Year. It was signed alias Jimmy V. Alias Jimmy V was a reference to a popular play of the time about a safecracker who manages to stay one step ahead of the cops. Taylor recognized the handwriting. It belonged to his ex-valet, Sands. But the name on the pawn ticket was even more upsetting. Sands used William Dean Tanner, Taylor's birth name. It confirmed Taylor's fears that Sands knew one of his big secrets, and it scared him. King strides through the precinct with a purpose. He's smelling blood. He can't believe Charlotte Shelby has opened the door to her own public hanging. But he's not one to look a gift horse in the mouth. Her lawyer's letter to the new DA, Veron Fitz, is a doozy. Prove me innocent, it says. Fitz tells King to heed the lady's wish, no matter where the evidence lands. The letter arrived on April 5th, and since then King has been back full-time on the Taylor homicide. In a lawsuit deposition, Charlotte's eldest daughter Margaret said that Mary and Charlotte weren't home for a period of time on the night of the murder. King had also re-interviewed the talkative former secretary Charlotte Whitney. She changed her story about that night and corroborated Margaret Shelby's statement. Indeed, Mary and Charlotte were not home the whole night. But King won't risk going back to the DA unless he has stronger evidence, not after getting shut down so many times. Whitney also said that the family chauffeur, Chauncey Eaton, had been privy to certain family secrets. That's why Eaton is in the interrogation room, cooling his heels. King left him there with only Sergeant Jesse Wynn for company. That will give him something to think about. King walks to the interrogation room door and pushes it open. Eaton is sitting quietly, ramrod straight in the chair, both feet on the floor. He's probably used to waiting in the car for his employers to return. Still, King can see the muscles on his mouth twitching. And in the ten seconds since the detective has been in the room, the guy has swallowed air twice. Nerves. Wynn leans against the wall behind him, a perfect portrait of brooding nonchalance. The sergeant hasn't taken his eyes off Eaton the whole time, a fact that hasn't escaped the chauffeur. He keeps glancing up as if expecting an anvil to be dropped any second. King slides into a chair opposite Eaton and puts a leather folder on the table, shielding it from view as he opens it. The page is blank, but he looks it up and down like he's reading it carefully. Then he clears his throat. <clears throat> so where's the gun? Eaton snaps his head up. What gun? King says he doesn't have time to haggle. He knows there's a gun, and he knows Eaton was around the night Mary faked her own suicide attempt. Eaton's eyes flit back and forth, like he's scanning his options. He doesn't have many. Oh, that gun! That was imaginative, King thinks, then says, Are there others? Eaton looks surprised. No. Jesus, she's not pretty boy Floyd. Answer the question. Eaton says he doesn't know. That's Mrs. Shelby's business. King tells him that Charlotte told him the gun was thrown away. I didn't do it. Why are you sweating me, Eaton says. Because you're close to these people, King tells him. 
because you know what goes on inside that family. You know what Mrs. Shelby is capable of. Eden insists he doesn't know anything. King gets up, slamming his folder shut. He turns to Wynn and shrugs. Then he tells Eden to get himself a lawyer. That stops Eden cold. Why does he need a lawyer? King asks him if he thinks Mrs. Shelby will protect him when the shit hits the fan. Whatever role you played in this, it was small and on someone else's orders. If you think Mrs. Shelby won't throw you to the wolves to save herself, you're living in a dreamland, pal. King turns to leave, but Eden has been doing the math. Wait, what about cutting me a deal? King wants to know what he's got to trade. Something better than the gun, Eden says. I know where you can find the bullets fired from it. Eden tells him Charlotte had him find and dispose of the bullets Mary fired in her fake suicide attempt. But Eden didn't throw them away. He placed the shells on a beam in the basement of Casa Margarita. As far as I know, they're still there. On Wednesday, February 1st, 1922, William Desmond Taylor slid into his tub for his morning bath. It was 7 a.m. In less than 14 hours, he would be dead. Taylor sunk into the steaming water, trying to let go of the anxieties he felt over the past several weeks, and then got out to dress. Temperatures were expected to be in the mid-30s for most of the day, so he chose a tan, three-piece gabardine suit, an overcoat, and scarf. Taylor had a long day of meetings and errands ahead. An hour later, he was sitting in his McFarlane, heading down Alvarado, when he heard the melodic blurp of a car horn. The director looked up to see his chauffeur pointing to a blue-colored Cadillac Roadster. Sir, isn't that Miss Minter? Taylor cranked the window down to offer a quick wave at Mary, who smiled broadly back at him. Should I stop? Fellows asked him. Taylor told him to drive on. As he watched her car disappear in traffic, he felt like he dodged a bullet. 10.30 a.m. Fellows drove him to Robinson's department store on West 7th Street. There, he quickly picked out two books he wanted to give to Mabel, the novel Rosamundi by Ethel Dell, because he knew she would appreciate its sweeping romance, and he also chose the new translation of a German criticism on Nietzsche. Taylor looked through the volume, smiling at the memory of their all-night debate over moralism. 12 noon, Taylor hurried into the LA Athletic Club on the corner of Olive and 7th for a lunch date with a studio executive. On the way in, he was stopped by actor Tony Moreno. Billy, I need some advice on a contract. I'd love your help. Taylor said to ring him later and they'd discuss it. 2 p.m., Taylor spent two hours with his accountant Marjorie Berger at her office going over his taxes. 4 p.m., Taylor phoned Mabel and got her housekeeper. Please say Mr. Taylor requests the honor of Miss Norman's company this evening, he joked. Say it just like that. 5 p.m., Taylor arrived at the Payne Dancing Academy on Orange Street for his tango lesson. He found it hard to concentrate. More than once, his instructor recommended they start over again. He walked home after, feeling the cold air on his face and counting the tango steps in his head. 6 p.m. While Taylor was letting himself into his house, a dark-haired man with a cap walked into a gas station on the corner of Alvarado and 6th. He asked the attendant if he knew the address of William D. Taylor. He replied yes. Taylor's car pulled in often for gas. The attendant gave him directions without a second thought. The man walked away. 6.40 p.m. Taylor took a call from Tony Moreno. They discussed Moreno's contract questions. 7 p.m. The temperature was dropping fast and the sun was setting when Mabel arrived at Taylor's bungalow. She brought her warmth and light through the door. As soon as Mabel sat down, he presented both books to her with a flourish. She was thrilled with her gifts, which made him happy. You're in a good mood, Billy, she said. It was true, right then he had forgotten all his worries. Henry Peavy wheeled in a silver and cut glass tray with two stemmed glasses and a cocktail shaker filled with a valet's orange-infused martinis. He greeted Mabel with a bow. How do you do, Miss Normand? I trust all is well with you. When Mabel stifled a chuckle, Taylor had to smile. He knew she thought Henry was comical. He didn't disagree. 7.10 p.m., a neighbor walking towards Alvarado Court, where Taylor lived, saw a man from a slight distance wearing a cap. For a moment, she thought it was Edward Sands, but wasn't sure. He seemed to be wandering aimlessly until he turned onto Maryland Street. It was the street right behind Taylor's apartment. 7.15 p.m., the maid of neighbors Doug and Faith McLean heard footsteps in the alley behind their house, headed toward the garage next to Taylor's bungalow. 7.20 p.m., Taylor dismissed Peavy for the night. The next half hour went by too fast. Mabel smoked and they drank and the gin worked wonders. She sat at the piano. She joked with him, deliberately playing off key to get him to laugh. He was happy. It had been a long time since he'd laughed so freely. 7.35 p.m. Mabel said she had an early call in the morning. Taylor still had his ledger to go through. He wished the night could go on just like this. He said he might call her later that evening to see if she'd had a chance to read any of the Nietzsche. Taylor helped Mabel on with her coat and walked her out to her car. Her chauffeur was standing by the door, a litter of peanut shells at his feet. Mabel admitted she'd stopped for some on the way. On the back seat, Taylor saw a copy of a book on Freud and the latest issue of the Police Gazette, a popular true crime magazine. Good Lord, Mabel, you're certainly going for the heavy reading this winter. They laughed together. He kissed her goodbye and she gently tugged his ear. Toodaloo, Billy. She slipped inside the car and he reminded her he'd call around nine. 
She pressed her lips against the window and he reached out to touch the glass. Then Taylor stood outside in the cool night air watching Mabel's rolls drive away. She blew him a kiss. He blew one back. 7.45 p.m. Taylor waited until the car's red taillights disappeared into the darkness. He stood for a moment, breathing the fragrant air filled with night-blooming jasmine. Gosh, he loved L.A. at night. Then he turned around and walked back inside the bungalow, not knowing he was about to face his killer. The motorcycle of Detective Ed King leads three black police cars as they race through the streets of Los Angeles to Charlotte Shelby's former home on 7th and Vermont. Sure, it's been 15 years since Shelby's driver, Chauncey Eaton, says he left the 38 caliber bullets in the basement, but D.A. Fitz dispatches the men to see what they can find. You never know. When King explains why a half a dozen detectives are standing on their front step, the current owners let them in. The men race downstairs and begin the search. It's not long before one of the detectives, running his fingers along a beam, yells out, Bingo. He hands the bullets to Lieutenant King, who can't believe it. They're old-style ammo, and they're 38 caliber, just like the one that killed Taylor. It's a miracle they're still here. And, King thinks, it's going to take a miracle to save Shelby now. On the next episode of Murder in Hollywoodland, a deathbed confession, and the story of a young actress who gets tantalizingly close to becoming a big-time star before falling in with the wrong people. And a former friend and colleague of Taylor's from the old days decides to make a movie about the murder 40 years later. This was episode five of six of Murder in Hollywoodland from Hollywood and Crime. If you like what you've heard, be sure to tell your friends and fans of true crime. We're counting on you to help us spread the word. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, the Wondery app, or wherever you're listening right now. Join Wondery Plus in the Wondery app to listen ad-free. In the episode notes, you'll find some links and offers from our sponsors. Please support them. Another way you can support the show is by filling out a small survey at wondery.com slash survey. Murder in Hollywoodland was written by Elizabeth Cosen and produced and edited by Laura Donna Palavoda. Additional editing assistance by Leah Sutherland. Sound design by Kyle Randall. Audio assistance by Sergio Enriquez. Additional audio editing by Marcelino Villalpando. Our consultant is William J. Mann. His book, Tinseltown, Murder, Morphine, and Madness at the Dawn of Hollywood, has a lot more amazing stories about Hollywood and the way the studios operated in the silent era. Executive producers are Marshall Louis, Stephanie Jens, and Hernan Lopez, or Wondery. You're about to hear a preview of Blood Ties from Wondery. While you're listening, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or listen ad-free in the Wondery app. This is Marie Richmond. I can't get to the phone right now, but please leave a message after the tone. Hi, Mom. I just got service back. We're close to the island. Um, can you call me, please? Dear Eleanor, you're texting. Don't write dear Eleanor when you're texting. How are you? Oh, Christ, Mom, come on. Dear Mother, please pick up the phone. Eleanor? Hello? Hi, Mom. What's wrong? What? Nothing. Why? Is everything okay? Yeah, everything's fine, honey. We're landing in, uh, what, 20 minutes, Peter? Peter? Yeah, yeah, your dad says 20 minutes. You sound like something's wrong. We'll talk when we land. Fantastic. You know, most families go to the living room to have a heart-to-heart. -heart. We go to the Caribbean. We got my email, didn't you? Your email? All the info is in the email I sent you, Elle. Mom, I don't think I got an email from you. One hour to port. One hour to port. Port? Eleanor, are you on a boat? Of course I'm on a boat, Mom. I thought you got over this. I'll fly when I absolutely have to, all right? Are you sure you sent that email? Because I'm checking and I don't have anything from you. Mom? Hello? Mom? That was the last conversation I ever had with my mom. My mom's name was Marie Richland. If you recognize it, it's probably because of my dad, Dr. Peter Richland, the cardiologist and healthcare magnate. If you've read one of his books or bought one of his products or even just heard of him, you know that they called him the father of two millions. Well, he's gone now. So is my mom. And that news is going to upset a lot of people at his company's headquarters, on Wall Street, even in Washington, D.C. Not to mention my brother, of course, and me. I'm going to hear things about my father that no one would dare breathe a word about to me when he was alive. But I don't know any of that yet. All I know is that I just dropped a call from my technology-challenged mother, 
and that the family will all be together soon for the holidays. From Wondery, this is Blood Ties. Sleigh bells ring, are you listening? In the lane, snow is glistening. A beautiful sight, we're happy tonight. Walking in a winter wonderland. This is episode one, postmortem. Well, here it is, the palm sweet. Same as always. Thank you, Merry Christmas. Michael? Michael, is that you? What's that sound? Michael! Hey, Elle, come in, come in! What the hell is this? Come on, you know what that is. No, I don't, and it's awful. Please turn it off. No, 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 no. It is not awful. It's wonderful. That sound that you hear right now is the most wonderful sound in the world. Well, where'd you get these giant speakers? I had them shipped here. I wanted to surprise you guys. Well, can you just please turn it off? All right. I wanted to tell you guys all together. That's a heartbeat? That's a baby? That is the sound of a 12-week-old fetal heartbeat. I'm gonna be a dad! So, who's the mom? What? Sophie. Sophie, my girlfriend in Boulder. Oh. Wait, why are you doing that? Doing what? With your face when you say something's great, but you look like you're hiding a turd in your mouth. Michael, I'm happy. I really am. I've never even met Sophie. That's not my fault. We've been together for almost a year. The last time I saw you two had just broken up. True. It's been a little up and down, but... uh... Oh, there they are. Finally. Wait, wait. Don't say anything. Okay? I want to tell them myself. Of course. Um, hi? These are a few of the members of the Island Children's Choir, here to wish Dr. Richland a Merry Christmas and welcome him on his return to our islands. Oh, wow. Well, thank you very much. I am honored. We'd also like to present you with a bottle of champagne, Paul Roger, your favorite, I believe. Oh, that is so very kind of you. I uh, thank you. Indeed, it's my favorite. I thought somehow you'd be older. <laughs> I'm flattered. Can you just stop? This is Michael Richland, my brother. You're looking for Dr. Peter Richland, our father. He hasn't arrived yet. Well, what time do you expect a doctor? Well, you're supposed to be here by now. Sorry to disturb you. We'll wait in a lobby. Uh, I'm an actual doctor, by the way. He's a plastic surgeon. It's all very technical work. This is Marie Richland. I can't get to the... Straight to voicemail again. Where are they? Why are we even here? Personally, I'm here for the mini bar. Do, do I do the $18 Coors Light or the $32 Bacardi and the $12 Coke? Mm, Bacardi and Coke. Better make it double. Okay, so mom said she sent me this email, but I didn't get anything. I feel like, mm-hmm. I feel like they have something to tell us. Or... Michael! That bottle's for dad! <sighs> it's almost 7 p.m. Champagne's been sitting out for two hours. Besides, the choir lady said it was for Dr. Richland, and I am Dr. Richland. Oh, God, that is lovely. Michael, listen. If they haven't landed yet. If they haven't landed yet, then we're going to have to spend the holidays listening to our father go on about landing the Cessna in a storm. Except he's going to call it a hurricane. I talked to mom when they were in the air. They were 20 minutes out, and that was three hours ago. Right. Yeah, they're coming on my phone, too. Kids, something's happening. She says something's happening. I love you both. Your dad is... These must be from earlier. Oh, thank God. Oh, thank God she's calling. Hello? Mom? Mom? Are you okay? Hello? Hey, close that window! Damn it! I cannot hear this guy! What guy? What's going on? Ugh. Fuck. What's going on? Oh. Okay. Um. Thank you. What? What is it? The plane crashed. My God, are they? They're, um, I think they're, he said, they're dead. Yeah. What do you mean? Well, um, um, they, they found mom. And they're, um, they're still looking for dad's body. My God. Coming up on this season of Blood Ties. Peter Richland's plane 
went missing yesterday with Dr. Richland and his wife, Marie, aboard. Eleanor Richland? Yes? This is Connie Beckwith calling. I'm a reporter for The Times. Listen, I can talk to you for the obituary or whatever another time. Um, sorry, this isn't for an obituary. I have information. Damaging information about your father. Let's just assume we know everything about everything, okay? The last thing my mom ever sent me was a text message. It said, something's wrong. Your dad is... My dad is... What exactly, Mom? What is he? We need to find out what the hell is happening. That was just a preview of Blood Ties. To listen to the rest of this episode and the series, listen and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening right now.